Homeland. Fatherland. Nation. What meaning do these terms have in our present day? In some countries, they seem like relics of forgotten times. But in others, they are ubiquitous in politics and society. One of these countries is Turkey. The reason for this is rooted in its past. Like any great civilization, the history of the early Turks began small and inconspicuous. They had to fight for freedom before they even became visible on the world stage. But the Turks' origins are not in Anatolia, which they have inhabited for a millennium, but deep in the heart of Asia. Their story began with a tribe that has long been forgotten, the Ashina. This tribe consisted of people who fled from an invasion of Chinese armies and had to rebuild their home. Soon the Ashina mingled with the surrounding Turkic tribes. In the process, they learned metallurgy and the art of war, and planned their retaliation. But for some time they remained vassals of more powerful empires. Two brothers, politically educated and military experienced, took over the leadership of the tribe and started a revolution. They rebelled against the Mongol and Chinese feudal lords of the time, and led their family to political and economic independence. In the process, they mobilized the strength that had always lain dormant deep in the steppe, and led men and women alike into battle. In a very short time, they also broke the chains of all other tribes that spoke Turkish and as their new leaders, expanded in all directions. The Ashina thus created within a few years, and long before the Ottomans and Seljuks, a Turkic empire that stretched from Korea and Manchuria in Asia, to the Crimean Peninsula in Europe. Their empire became even larger than that of the Ottomans a millennium later. They gave themselves the name Turk. But these new lords of the steppe were different from the Huns and the Mongols. Their rulers invoked ancient Turkic traditions such as Tengrism, the original religion of the Turkic peoples, and did not stop at the usual borders of the Eurasian steppe. Byzantines, Persians, Koreans and Chinese had to deal with an empire that possessed both diplomatic skill and military power. This is their story. Welcome to the rise of the Celestial Turks. The Turks have lived in Anatolia for more than a thousand years. Their country, Turkey, is known for its geographical, but also cultural diversity, and forms a bridge between East and West. Here, over time, world religions and people from all over the world met, and formed a melting pot of cultures. Every visitor can experience flowing transitions between tradition and modernity, from Adern to Diyarbakir. And yet the specific influence of Turkish culture cannot be overlooked. The Turks are known for their national pride and their will to fight but also, for their delicious food, their coffee and tea, and cultural dispositions such as hospitality and family cohesion. They began the settlement of Anatolia after the victory of Sultan Alp Arslan of the Seljuks over Byzantium, and established a world empire that reached to the gates of Vienna under the name of Osman. But there is a peculiarity which had strongly marked the Turks until their arrival in Anatolia. Their cultural past has been marked by many changes and their appearance may have changed, but the Turks in Turkey speak a language and maintain a culture, whose origins lie elsewhere. And this is a special characteristic of all Turkic peoples. They never lived in one place for too long. This map from the 11th century illustrates this. For thousands of years, so-called Turkic peoples, groups that spoke one of the many Turkic languages, lived all over Eurasia. Instead of being united in an empire, they were grouped into smaller federations, and some tribes were even in isolation from all others. The Turks of that time stayed in the Eurasian steppe belt, which has diverse geographical features from Ukraine to Mongolia. On the path to the interior of Asia, the steppe leads us to the place that became known as the origin of all Turks, equal to their dialect and way of life. To the legendary Altai. This region includes both green landscapes with many rivers and valleys and a mountain range that stretches across the entire area. Known in Chinese as Tian Shan, the highest peak is Tengri Khan, named after the ruler of heaven in Turkic mythology. This golden mountain is located in a border region that is currently divided among four countries. From here, it is over 4,000 kilometers distance to Ankara, the capital of Turkey. How and why did the Turks migrate so far away to the west? 
in the nearer vicinity, in countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and also in the northeast and south of Russia, are people who are also classified as Turkic. But away from Asia, besides the Anatolian Turks, other ethnic groups have migrated far away. For example, the Gagors of Romania, the Turkmen of Syria and Iraq, or the Tatars of Crimea. These people are not 100% purely Turkish in origin, because genealogy has shown that they are descendants of many different ethnic groups. Turkic as an ethnicity emerged only over time, but their identity, shaped by language, tradition and religion, is precisely Turkic. This identity has endured for many centuries, and after the end of the Ottoman Empire in 1922 and the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Turkic peoples, from Europe to Asia, began to become aware of the origin of their social order. Nevertheless, the question of why many more Turks live in these places today, rather than in the Altai region, is justified. It leads us to the history of the emergence of Turkic identity, to a story that relates to tragedy and hope at the same time, to the legend of Asina. As so often in history, wars between states or ethnic groups in Asia's late antiquity, led to flight and displacement all over the place. South of the Altai is the Taklamakan Desert, an inhospitable place to live. On the northern ring however, at the transition to the Altai, better living conditions prevailed. From the Tarim Basin to the Gaocheng region, that belt was dotted with many oasis towns. Many peoples, including Chinese and Indo-Iranians, lived and ruled here for over a millennia. In late antiquity, families descended from the legendary Huns had say here. In 439, Chinese dynasties began to expel these families. In one village, all the family members were even killed by the invaders, all except for a ten-year-old boy who managed to escape. However, the boy was injured and didn't get very far. That's when he came across a she-wolf who befriended him. The ruler of the invaders learned of this and ordered his soldiers to kill the boy as well as the she-wolf, but the she-wolf fled with the boy at inhospitable speed to a mountain, north of the Gaocheng region. They arrived at the Altai. She housed him at a cave surrounded by a plain with rich vegetation. The she-wolf fed the boy and watched him grow into a man. At some point, the two merged, and she gave birth to ten little boys, who then grew into strong men. In adulthood, these ten left the cave area and mingled with the surrounding villages. Each of them in turn had children, and so an extended family of 700 came to be. They all bore the name Ashina, in honor of their mother, who was called Asina. The symbol of the wolf has been omnipresent in Turkish literature and in some political circles ever since. But Asina was not a grey wolf as often told, but a blue wolf. Blue because of her fur, which shimmered bluish when the boy saw her. And because of her connection to Goktengri, the ruler of the eternal blue sky, who, acting as a god, had brought Asina to earth to save the boy from death. With new courage, the Ashina men learned the art of war and took revenge on their father's enemies. The legend of Asina at this moment passes to the legend of Urjim Khan. The protective mountain ranges, where the boy and the she-wolf had taken refuge, represented the only protection of the family from the enemies. A blacksmith, presumably one of the ten sons, made a hammer with the help of which the men could smash the mountain range, and clear the way. This opened the gate to the outside world. This moment was the mythical birth of the Turk. So, the Turk was literally a wolf's son, and had a talent for forging metals, with which it was possible to make weapons. This story is a myth that is supposed to metaphorically explain the origin of the Turkic civilization. Interestingly, it has parallels with the origin stories of the Indo-Aryan Wuzan, who lived nearby, and even with that of the Romans. The city of Rome came into being after orphaned brothers Romulus and Remus were taken in and suckled by a she-wolf. The two grew up to be men, and Romulus created the city named after him. The wolf then played a not insignificant role in the collective consciousness of the Romans as a national animal, along with the eagle. For the Turks, in turn, the wolf has since then taken on a particularly important role in cosmology. It is the original national animal of all Turkic peoples. But the myth is based on a true incident. The special units of the Gokturks were called Boru, meaning wolves. 
Moreover, the rulers of the Gokturks held annual ceremonies in the Ancestor's Cave to commemorate the Urgene Khan legend. And the Chinese annals tell us about a historical event that could explain the background of the legend. The last Hun princes in Gaochang, Wu Hui and Anshu, once fled north from an invading army and arrived in the Altai region, where they resettled with their families. There, they became vassals of the Ruran. The Turks, as is well known, had later also been their vassals, and coincidentally appear in the chronologies of Asia at the very time in Altai, in 439, when the last Huns disappeared from history. This is the origin of the claim by Chinese scholars that the Turks are the descendants of the ancient Huns. In any case, the real life of the Turks at that time was anything but mythical. Rather, it was exhausting and extremely routine. Turks in medieval Central Asia seem to have led a completely different life than people in modern Turkic republics. This includes of course, their lifestyle of domestic and livestock farming. They lived not in houses but in yurts, large sturdy tents that could be dismantled and rebuilt elsewhere at any time. The yurt represented the center of Turkic nomadic life. In the winter, families used it to move to the warmer south, and in the summer months back to the north to escape the heat. The Turks practiced private economy by hunting animals, raising livestock, plantations, and participating in the lively trade along the ancient Silk Road. Hunting was essential for every member of the family. From an early age, every boy and girl learned to ride horses and hunt wild animals. Therefore, in the course of time, the Turks developed into excellent fighters who could handle bows and arrows better than for example, the Romans or the Chinese. It was the same with the Huns before them and with the Mongols after them. This was the heritage of the steppe. Traditions gradually crystallized and were passed on from generation to generation, often in the form of drama and song. These traditions are summarized under the term Tore. In all those times, the Turks lived in connection with nature. And their Tore, in turn, was closely connected with their religion. Tengrism encompasses the belief in Tengri, the ruler of the eternal blue sky, a being that, unlike other religions, has not been personified. Tengri is an entity that sees and hears everything. However, Tengri is not explicitly a punitive god. If someone had lived a morally good life, they would be treated well in the afterlife. Someone who had consistently misbehaved would have to bear the consequences, and go through the many levels of the underworld, until they would have to answer to its godlike being, Ehrlich. This is the first aspect that makes Tengrism so unique. Despite its seemingly monotheistic orientation, there are many other divine beings such as Ehrlich or Umri, the protector of all unborn children and to be equated with Mother Earth. People whose souls were not at rest at death are reborn and given a second chance to live a decent life. The souls of all other people are partially transferred into things in nature. Trees, mountains, rivers and lakes are inhabited by the so-called earth water spirits, who are supposed to ensure a balance between nature and man. Many Tengrist customs have survived and are still practiced in Turkic-speaking countries, from Turkey to Kazakhstan, among the Yakuts in Siberia as well as the Tatars in Crimea. Examples include certain rules of behavior after the birth of a child and before the funeral of a family member, the decorating of wishing trees, sacred numbers such as 7 and 40 and the shaman drum. The shaman did not play a central role in Tengrism, the ancient Turks were not shamanists, although the shaman performed important tasks. For example, he mastered herbalism and acted as a healer of the sick. He also had to perform ceremonial rites to contact Tengri and the other deities, and thus give advice to the ruler. In general, Tengrism is a harmonious balance of forces. Ideally, people should live in harmony with nature. They should not eat and drink more than necessary. They should not cause destruction to other peoples and should not exploit them or nature for their own benefit. Related to this is the acceptance of other religions. Tengrism was syncretic, meaning that its followers accepted aspects of other religions and even incorporated them into their beliefs, much like the Romans, Egyptians or Sumerians. The polytheistic character of the faith can be seen in the variety of deities or godlike beings that are firmly anchored in Turkish mythology, such as Kyra, who carries the soul of Tengri and watches over the universe. Alaz, is the god of fire, who could purify the souls of people after their sojourn in the underworld. 
Uljin acted as Tengri's vice, stood for good, welfare and surplus of food and water. He is an opponent of Ehrlich. In an epic battle, Uljin was able to defeat Ehrlich, and from that moment he assumed the role of protector of the people. Isid, like Umri, was goddess of fertility and responsible for listing all newborns in the Golden Book of Destiny. While Ayata, god of the moon, dwelled on the sixth floor of the sky, along with Gun Anna, goddess of the sun. Values such as courage, modesty and justice were held in high esteem by the Turks as well as the Mongols and Huns. Equality between the Turkic woman and man was considered absolute. While most of the rulers of the Tengris states may have been male, women assumed roles not only as diplomats but also as generals and governors. For the most part, their roles were to maintain social order and strengthen cohesion among the people. The Chinese scholars, who wrote a great deal about the ancient Turks, found such emancipatory qualities unusual and even ridiculous. Nonetheless, they were amazed by the honesty that was widespread among the common people, from which they partly inferred the naivety and good nature of Turkic rulers. But the most important teaching of Tengrism is to learn from mistakes, to leave the past behind and to create a better future for oneself and one's family. Thus, everything that exists is part of an eternal cycle of life. For this reason, trees, like the tree of life, are sacred beings in Turkic mythology, along the wolf or the horse. Man is as much a part of this world as plants or animals, but unlike them, he can intentionally harm his environment. Therefore, he must observe certain rules in order to maintain the balance of power. Someone who must go to the underworld after death is not trapped there forever anyway. Instead, the souls are allowed to ascend to the afterlife after their punishment has been served, and settle on the third floor of the afterlife. The afterlife and the underworld have each seven floors. Tengri dwells on the highest floor of heaven, and Ehrlich on the last floor of the underworld. Connected to this is the idea of the tree of life, which connects heaven and underworld with earth, and allows ascent and descent between these dimensions. The Turks thus shared in their cosmology a concept that exists in the Scandinavian countries of Europe, and Tengri bears striking similarities to the Sumerian god Dinja and to Deus, the sky god of Indo-European mythology. In any case, Tengrism is not dogmatic. Someone who constantly praises Tengri but leads an antisocial life, must pay Ehrlich a visit after death. But another human who would not have even prayed to Tengri or ever thought of him, perhaps even been a follower of other religions, but instead led a good life, would be rewarded by Tengri after death. The details of social order, meaning rights and prohibitions in a nation, must be worked out by the people among themselves. Tengrism merely provides the framework for coexistence. In this sense, Tengrism is less a religion, and more a philosophy of life. About a hundred years after the flight to the Altai Mountains, the Ashina reappear in history. In the meantime, the clan had joined forces with the surrounding population, and nevertheless managed to hold its own against undesirable influences. But the leader of the Ashina, an elderly man named Tuwu, could not prevent the vassalization of the Rurin. The Rurin were the lords of the steppe at that time. They ruled over a territory that stretched from Manchuria, to present-day Kazakhstan. Their ruler bore the title of Kargan, and saw himself as God's representative on earth. He looked down from his position on all those who lived in his realm and had to serve him. In addition to the Ashina, this included the Tila, a loose confederation of many Turkic tribes. Tuwu was not strong enough to put an end to this. But his son Bumin was fed up with the Kargan's rule, and especially, with the lowly position of his family. In the year 545, he took over the leadership of the Ashina. At that time, the clan's members were known throughout the region as industrious blacksmiths who made their own weapons. Accordingly, Bumin set out on a customary raid into Chinese territory, without the help of his Kargan. In northern China, two large families ruled, who were actually descendants of the ancient Huns. This two Oba family had later split, and now the Western Wei and Northern Qi were hostile to each other. When the Ashina arrived in the Wei region, their chancellor, Yuan Tai, saw a unique opportunity. The young Bumin seemed ambitious and capable, and he was tired of Ruan rule, as were the Wei. Therefore, Yuan Tai approached him and proposed the establishment of trade relations. Bumin accepted the request, and thus began a secret alliance between the Ashina and the Wei. 
Shortly thereafter, a rebellion broke out among the Tila, threatening the rule of the Rurin. But the Kargan unexpectedly received help from the Ashina. Buming crushed the revolt of the Tila Federation. He was the first to bring the 250,000 strong group of steppe warriors under his direct control. Afterwards, he sought out the Kargan and demanded the hand of his daughter, as a thank you for his efforts. But Anagui, the Kargan, refused, calling Bumin a lowly slavesmith. In doing so, Anagui had set off a chain of events that would result in his downfall. Bumin angrily broke off all relations with the Rurin, and instead asked for the hand of a Wei princess. Yuantai agreed and sent the emperor's daughter, Changle, to the Ashina. The alliance of the two families was now complete, and with the Tila warriors in reserve, Bumin began a revolt of his own against the Rurin. Bumin's army defeated Anagui's forces in a great battle in Mongolia in 552. The defeat was so devastating that Anagui committed suicide, and his family fled to China. The Rurin were forced to retreat from the steppe and found refuge with the Northern Qi, rivals of the Wei. Bumin now ascended to the vacant throne, assumed the title of Kargan, and founded his own empire, the Empire of the Turks. Princess Changul became Kargatun, or Hatun, a fellow empress, and the Ashina the new ruling dynasty of the Asian steppe. Within six years, Bumin had accomplished what the Ashina and other Turkic tribes could not do in 600. For the first time in history, a state emerged that was both inhabited and ruled by Turks. A state that became even larger than any steppe empire prior. The Ashina referred to themselves as Turuk, or Torok, from which the name Turk is derived. The name probably referred only to their own tribe. But they were not the only Turks around. Most of the ethnic groups of the Tila Federation, and other tribes and kingdoms of Eurasia, spoke the same language as the Ashina, Old Turkic. When Bumin's family extended their influence over the entire steppe, they too adopted the term Turk. Their language and traditions had already been the same. But now the Turks of the early Middle Ages were also, politically, united. Bumin was not the first Turkic ruler in history, but he was the first to demand to be called the ruler of the Turks. With the ambition to unite the other Turkic tribes of Asia under his banner, Bumin set to work with his brother, Istemi, to expand their realm. Together they led the Ashina family to fame and power. Their first great goal however, laid not in Central Asia, China or Europe, but in Korea. Bumin wasted no time. With the Ashina Turkic nobility as his supporters and a large warrior caste in tow, he now controlled the entire Rurin territory, from Lake Alakol in Kazakhstan to the Gobi Desert, and the Tarim Basin to the Great Wall of China. The inhospitable north was claimed by autonomous tribes. In the south, he was confronted with two empires, whose leaders were of Hun origin, he maintained a good relationship with the Western Wei, after they had indirectly supported him in the War of Independence. The Northern Qi on the other hand were hostile to the Turks. But while the revolution against the Rurin was still underway, Bumin had already turned to his first foreign policy goal. For he wanted to take advantage of the general chaos in the region, and expand in as many directions as possible. The Koreans populated the outermost settlements on the coast to the Pacific, and had led an independent existence for centuries. The settlement area of the Koreans was divided into several empires. The southern part was ruled by states that competed in alternating coalitions. The north belonged to the dominion of the Guguryeo. This kingdom formed the pinnacle of Korean civilization. For 500 years, they ruled over northern Korea, Manchuria, and even parts of Mongolia. The Guguryeo had made contact with the Huns in ancient times, but this was stopped by the Han Chinese. Now, contact was again made with a steppe people. But the Turks did not come with peaceful intentions. In September of the year 551, an army of Turkic warriors appeared on the border of Guguryeo. The army laid siege to the settlement of Sinsong. It then moved on and attacked a major city nearby. King Yang I of Guguryeo then dispatched an army of 10,000 men. The Korean counterattack was successful, and the Turks retreated to the steppes. The first contact between Turks and Koreans had been hostile in nature. But this event later turned out to be a key moment for Turkish-Korean relations. Enemies would later become friends. For the moment, the Liao River represented the easternmost border of the Turkic Empire.
At home, Buming could look back on an empire with an impressive army and considerable territory, and in terms of power politics he was in no way inferior to his predecessor, Anagui. In the highest place of the political hierarchy was he himself, the Khagan, the emperor. The Turkic Empire was not built on an invasion from outside, but on an internal revolution. Therefore, Bumin did not tamper too much with the political structures of the steppe. The Ashina now provided the Shads and Tegins of the empire, princes and generals. In addition, the title of Beg existed among the ancient Turks. The Begs were tribal leaders of autonomous families. But after they had all become subordinate to the Khagan, the Begs no longer had autonomous foreign policy at their disposal. However, they did have the authority to lead military commands in the name of the Khagan. The term Beg developed into the honorary title of Bey, later on. The Khagan's legitimacy was built on the support of the Begs. But his rule was indirect. Bumin appointed governors and tributary kings to maintain unity among the various tribes and peoples. His state is known to us today as the Empire of the Gokturks. Gok, in Turkish, stands for the color blue, and accordingly for the blue sky. The eastern direction of the sky was also symbolized by the blue. Gok, comes from the original word kok, which also meant origin. Gok Turks can therefore be translated as original, blue, and celestial Turks at the same time. Celestial, perhaps, because their leaders, were chosen by Tengri to rule. The Khagan was treated like a sacred being, a ruler blessed by Tengri. To stand against the Khagan meant to stand against the will of Tengri. The Khagan had more kut, than any other human being. Kut means sacred power or energy, and in terms of people, charisma, and luck. The Khagan's mobile residence was in Otukan, in a forest town from which the cut emitted. Whoever ruled Otukan, the cut bestowed victory and success against all enemies. This was also the condition for successful rule. However, Bumin died under mysterious circumstances shortly after founding his empire. Before his demise, he had made a momentous decision. Instead of one, there were to be two rulers in the Khaganate. Given the sheer size of the empire, this was imperative. But no dual kingship was established. Instead, the Khagan remained in Ichukan, while another member of the Ashina was to take care of all the territories to the west. To establish the empire, it was Istemi, young brother of Bumin, who was given the title of viceroy. He had to recognize the authority of the Khagan over his domain. In case of doubt, the Khagan had the last word. After Bumin's death, his eldest son Kara became the new Khagan. And while Kara had to take care of the Ruran remnants, that plagued the Gokturk's border region with China, his uncle Istemi, was already on his way, to Europe. Why did the Gokturks need to conquer new territories? Probably not out of boredom, because this region of the Eurasian steppe, was already filled to the brim with numerous tribes, and city-states. Convincing them of the Ashina's rule was no child's play for sure. For here lived people who rejected any higher authority, except that of Tengri, and preferred self-government. A large part of them however, belonged to the Turkic culture group. It can only be speculated that this was the main reason that prompted Istemi's campaign to the west. The Ashina probably already knew that there were many other Turkic peoples apart from those living around the Altai. And now it was necessary to unite them all under their rule. Istemi began his campaign in the spring of 553. The army of the Gokturks reached the Great Lake Yedisu in the summer. From here, the Gokturks had access to the trade routes of the Silk Road, which ran from China to Persia. Numerous tribes such as the Hun Kyanites now joined the Turks. The Khaganate of the Gokturks thus bordered the empire of the Hephthalites, who were also called the White Huns, and ruled over a wide strip from the Aral Sea to India. Practically between Turkic and Hunnic territory lay the trading city of Bukhara. This ancient settlement blossomed into an important trading metropolis along the Silk Road during the Middle Ages. Even now, in the middle of the 6th century, Bukhara possessed an important influence on trade in the region. Merchants from Byzantium, Iran, and China met here, and regularly exchanged their goods with each other. Bukhara occupied an important economic position along the Silk Road, and would soon stand at the center of a major conflict. On the northwestern front, the Gokturks had to expect a lot less resistance. This region had been a permanent settlement area of Eurasian steppe peoples for centuries, which appeared in the writings of ancient historians like Hero. 
However, a collective name like Scythians would distort the real relations among the ethnic groups. Thus, in the 5th century, the scholar Priscus of Panium reported that the Saragas and Arnagas arrived at the Eastern Roman in Constantinople and asked him for help. They had been driven out of their homeland on the Black Sea by the Sabees, who in turn, had been the victims of an attack by the Avars, who had extended their empire into Western Asia, and were teeling to settle there. We can conclude that the influence of Turkic culture already reached deep into Eastern Europe when the Ashina arrived there. Because the Arnagas as well as the Saragas were part of the Oga Federation, which in turn was a branch of the Turkic Tila Confederation. This would explain the absence of any sources on the battles of the Gok Turks in their expansion into Europe, there were simply no battles to record. The Turks from East Asia did not fight the Turks in the West, and yet, or perhaps because of this, were able to integrate them so quickly into their empire. But when Istemi's armies arrived in Eastern Europe, they were on the trail of another ethnic group. A band of refugees who had tried to seek safety from the Turks. The Rurun. While their ruling dynasty took refuge in northern China, most of the lower nobility, including the knights, headed for Western Asia. In the process, they encountered and mingled with the Avars, who probably had ties to the Rurun. Due to thin sources, Rurun and Avars cannot be equated, but it can very well be assumed that the Rurun refugees took control over the Avars. Therefore, within a short period of time, the Avars developed from a tribal federation to a Khaganate. The title of Khagan, which now actually belonged to the Gokturks, was claimed, and continued by the Rurun in Europe. Therefore, the Turks were after them. A correspondence between Istemi and Byzantium further reveals that these Avars were well known to the Gokturks. Before their tribe could rise to a great empire, the Avars had to consolidate their rule over the Slavic and partly Germanic tribes, and for this they needed a promise of protection from Byzantium. In doing so, however, they were pursued by Istemi's retaliatory troops. In a message to Emperor Mauricios, he let it be known what he intended to do with the Avars. The Byzantines, in turn, hoped to mobilize the Turks against their archenemy Persia in the east. The centuries-long wars between Byzantium and Persia were like a tug-of-war for supremacy in the Middle East, and the Turks became an important factor in this confrontation. But the Avars had successfully driven a wedge between the Turks and the Eastern Romans. There was no rapprochement between the Turks and Byzantines. After consolidating Turkic rule in Kazakhstan and parts of Eastern Europe, Istemi turned to Bactria and Sogdia, the gateways to the Middle East. South of the Hephthalites, in Iran, the Sassanids, who had established a new Persian Empire after the collapse of the Parthian Empire, were just waiting to re-establish their historical dominance over Transoxiana. The Sassanids and Hephthalites were therefore hostile to each other. Then, shortly before the outbreak of hostilities between the Persians and Huns, the Gokturks arrived in the area. Like the Byzantine Emperor, the Persian king now turned his attention to this new great power. The Turks, under the banner of the Gokturk Khaganate, were militarily more tightly organized than ever before. All the smaller tribes in the area now pooled their military capacities, and could march at Istemi's command. But in the event of Istemi's conquest of Sogdia and Bactria, the Turks could have closed the Silk Road to Persian or Byzantine traders at will at any time. Therefore, the Sassanids secretly approached Istemi, and made him a proposal he could not refuse. On the other side of the continent, intrigues were afoot that would decisively shape the political future of East Asia, for the next 200 years. The Qi dynasty, fearing an invasion by the Gokturks, had a 400-kilometer wall built along the border with the Khaganate. At the same time, the Qi housed high-ranking Rurin dynasty members. The neighboring Wei dynasty on the other hand, had immediately handed over Rurin refugees who arrived on its territory to the Gokturks. There had been a cold war between Wei and Qi for some time, and the Gokturks played a central role during this conflict as a third faction, similar to the situation in the Middle East. Despite walls and state borders, the traffic of merchants and traders was relatively borderless in those days. Kara, the new Khagan of the Gokturks, took the title of Isik, and led a campaign against Dengzhu, the leader of the Rurun. Emperor Wenxuan, himself descended from the Turko-Mongols Yanbei, had offered Dengzhu and his family protection from the Turks. In February of the year 553, 
However, Deng Zhu was forced by Wen Xuan to go into battle against the Gokturks himself, thus maintaining Qi influence on the steppe. In the spring, Deng Zhu marched into Mongolia, but Isik Kagan was able to overwhelm his army and defeated them in the Battle of Ordos. After months of intrigues within the Ruran dynasty, Anlu Okan, the last son of Anagui, assumed the position of leader on the orders of Emperor Wen Xuan. Al Nushan, incidentally, was a son-in-law of the emperor. Taking advantage of this family alliance, the Qi emperor hoped to persuade the Ruran to attack the Turks again. But An Laochen realized how he was being used as a pawn and rebelled against Qi rule. He led 50,000 men into battle in September, but was defeated by the imperial army. Wen Xuan again repelled a second Ruran attack in the winter, and had some 30,000 Ruran members captured. Women and children were sent into slavery. The Qi had defeated the Ruran, but exhaustion had gradually set in due to the exertions of recent years. Apart from the misguided strategy of Wen Xuan, a permanent alcoholic, their geopolitical position was deteriorating massively. And the Gok Turks under the banner of Isik had, for their part, secured the borders with the northern Chinese states, and furthermore prevented a return of their former feudal lords to the steppes. At that very moment, Isik died. Circumstance of his death? Allegedly an illness. Fortunately, a state crisis was averted after Mukun, the next eldest son of Bumin, ascended the throne with the support of the nobility, and stabilized the political situation in the year 554. In the following years, Mukun pursued an active foreign policy by destroying the remnants of the Ruran in the northwest, and subjugating the stubborn Kyrgyz on the Yenisei. The Kyrgyz were known for their mining, and were now supplying the Gokturks with gold deposits. Shortly thereafter, Mukun also conquered Kitan territory, and integrated these proto-Mongols into his empire. The power of the Turkic Empire grew rapidly in a short time. In 554 or 555, the empire of the Gokturks was already twice as large as the legendary steppe empire of the Asian Huns. And thanks to the Sogdians' assured supply of gold and iron and control of trade along the Silk Road, the Khaganate became increasingly attractive to merchants and traders from around the Vald. The Turks increasingly hosted diplomats and religious pilgrims from India, Tibet, and China. Although the Sogdians lived in the western part of the empire, they had already opened trade routes to China while the Huns still ruled over the steppe peoples. After the establishment of the Turkic Empire, more and more of them flocked to the east. Gradually, Sogdian merchants settled in Otukan and on the Altai, and took over administrative activities in the service of Mukun. The Sogdians became intermediaries for the Turks in their disputes with the Chinese. In the process, they also lent the Turks their script, which later became the Old Turkic script. Thus, the national alphabet of the Turks was born. Almost at the same time, the Western Wei collapsed. They were replaced by the Northern Zhu under the leadership of Yuan Tai, Bumin's acquaintance. Yuan Tai had been active in the service of the Western Wei as a high-ranking general for 20 years. He died in 557 after the establishment of his own empire. His two successors each died after a short time. It was not until Emperor Wu took office, that a prolonged period of stability began in the Zhu Empire. Under these circumstances, Emperor Wu pursued a more offensive foreign policy against the rival Northern Qi dynasty. To achieve his goals, he needed the help of the Turks, with whom Emperor Wu had reaffirmed the alliance, shortly after coming to power. He made the following proposal to Mukun. Turks and Zhu Chinese would go to war against the Qi. The Turks would be allowed to keep their booty. In return, Mukun would bequeath one of his daughters to Emperor Wu. Mukun agreed. Thus, both rulers linked their family alliance with their geopolitical interests. In the west the Byzantines and Avars, in the south the Huns and Persians, in the east the Koreans and Chinese. After a period of success, difficult geopolitical times were ahead. The fate of the empire, and its inhabitants, was now in the hands of Istemi and Mukun. The 560s began for the Gokturks with two major military conflicts. The first took place in Transoxiana after Istemi's troops marched as far as Bukhara. Turks and Huns fought each other for seven days and seven nights in a massive battle. On the eighth day, the Turks captured the Ark, a citadel and ruling palace of Bukhara, wresting the city from Hunnic control. Later, it would turn out that Istemi had held a secret rendezvous with the Persian king Khosrow, shortly before the battle. 
both had agreed on a joint war against the White Huns. When the Turks entered Bukhara from the northeast, Persian soldiers from the southwest marched in at the same time. Thus, the White Huns were attacked in from both sides, and quite frankly annihilated. Bukhara went to the Turks. After Istemi established his rule over the trading city, he learned that the Hunnic nobility had left the area before the battle, and fled to Afghanistan. There they crowned a man named Faganish as their king. But after the Persians invaded there as well, Faganish became distressed, and had to submit his people to the rule of the superior Persians. Istemi then changed his attitude toward the Huns, and offered Faganish both refuge and a piece of land in the Khaganate. Faganish accepted, and so the remaining Hephthalites became Istemi's vassals. They were allowed to retain lesser Hunnic royal titles, and were only required to recognize the authority of the Ashina dynasty. Istemi thus integrated Hunnic warriors into his army, and with the conquest of Sobdia, deprived the Persians of an important source of power. In the following years, many Turks settled in the cities along the Silk Road, including Tashkent and Samarkand, so that they came into close contact with the Sobdians, a people consisting mainly of merchants, traders, and diplomats. The surrounding region is now known as Turkestan, the land of the Turks, who rose to become the dominant culture in the centuries that followed. While the Gokturks were still in power, there was a real economic boom in Central Asia. Chinese reports show that agriculture, manufactures, and trade of the mainly Iranian natives in the west of the Khaganate, experienced a new heyday. The Gokturks also financially supported the development of infrastructure, for example, sewage systems in Sogdia were repaired after decades of wars. The Tashkent region of Kyrgyzstan also saw technical advances in pottery and glazing. However, after the White Huns were defeated, the Khaganate bordered the Persian Empire for the first time. The border remained unsettled. In addition, there was the question of control of the trade routes leading to East Asia. The battle for the Silk Road had just begun. Meanwhile, in the east, Mukan joined the Zhu dynasty in the war against the Qi dynasty. The southern front was led by Zhu general Daxi Wu. His goal was to capture the border town of Pingyang. In the north, a combined Turkic-Chinese army attacked. The Turkic warriors joined forces with an army of Chinese led by Yang Zhong. The combined force then marched into the Qi area, and advanced to Taiyuan. The northern Qi, led by Emperor Wu Cheng, could not withstand the onslaught of the Zhu and Gokturks. However, Wu Cheng did not stand by idly. He instructed the legendary general, Hu Lu Guang, to stop the Zhu attack in the south. At the same time, Wu Cheng himself marched off to Taiyuan with an army to repel Yang Zhong and the Turks. When he entered the city, he was so impressed by the strength of the enemy soldiers, that he initially wanted to flee the battlefield. Only at the urging of some high-ranking princes did Wu Qing turn back, and face his enemies. The Qi were unable to drive out the attacking army, but were able to hold Taiyuan for the time being. The city was then besieged by the Turkic army in the winter of 563-564, but never fully brought under control. It was not until the following spring that Wu Cheng was able to turn the tide, and force the Zhu Gokturk army to retreat. At the same time, Hu Lu Guang's forces were victorious over Daxi in the south. Thus, the first offensive of the Gokturks and the Zhu Empire had failed to meet expectations. Daxi led a second offensive the following year. This time, the Qi Emperor Wu Cheng ordered the two generals Duan and Hu Lu to protect Luoyang from the Zhu onslaught. Indeed, the combined Qi army quickly defeated the forces of Daxi. While Hulu could rejoice in the rise of his prestige and a title awarded by the emperor, Wu Qing had to worry about the fact that it had been mainly the Gok Turks who had attacked and successfully plundered the Taiyuan area. The Turks had retreated without suffering any casualties, and they had not even joined the second offensive, while the Zhu only narrowly lost the battle. In the end, the Ashina and Zhu dynasty sent signs of strength to the Qi, and the Turks asserted themselves as a major power in the region. Both wars, in Afghanistan as well as in China, had a tremendous impact on the political course of the following two decades. As an indirect consequence, the Turks came to control the Silk Road in the medium term, a road that actually consisted of many smaller trade roads, which in turn spanned two continents. For the longest time, the notorious commodity, silk, had been exclusively cultivated in East Asia. 
Later, the Persians also gained access to this luxury good, which was used primarily for the production of high-quality textiles. Besides silk, cotton, spices, minerals and other valuable goods were also transported and traded. Trade was carried out by merchants who acted as private individuals along the trading posts. But trade was sometimes associated with customs duties. An estate that had the military upper hand along the trading posts could trade to merchants from certain countries. After the Battle of Bukhara, the Persian court was considering how the Turks could harm Persian trade, for example, by denying access to Persian merchants to create economic pressure. A distinctive feature of Turkic rule, however, is the fact that they did not plunder or even wipe out the cities along the trade routes, as the Mongols would do some 700 years later. Instead, they incorporated these cities into their khaganate, and in some cases took over their administration. Istemi appears to have been a diplomatically savvy and intelligent politician, as he managed to establish his rule over Transoxiana, without causing resentment among the inhabitants toward the Turks. Istemi did not interfere in the religion, culture, or economy of the locals. Instead, he integrated individual personalities into his system of vassals, deputies, advisors, and courtiers. This form of indirect rule was common among Turkic empires. But Istemi had great ambitions. Conversely, the Sogdians had already made plans to expand their influence along the Silk Road, with the help of the Gokturks. They wanted to increase trade with the Byzantine Empire. But first they had to obtain permission from the Persian king to pass through Persian territory in order to reach Anatolia. The skepticism of each other was mutual. Fearing that Istemi was secretly preparing an invasion of Sassanid territory, Khosrow personally marched one day with a large army to the border region of Tabaristan, also called Gurgan, on the southern coast of the Caspian Sea. And indeed, there he met Istemi in person, who seemed as if he had already been expecting Khosrow. The Turks had passed the Oxus and were not in front of, but already behind, the gates of the Iranian highlands. Khosrow kept calm and presented Istemi with numerous gifts. Presumably they were celebrating a joint feast. In the process, Khosrow managed to persuade Istemi to hand over his Hun vassal Faganish to the Persian capital. As a result of the agreement, part of the Hephthalites became a vassal state of the Sassanids. In return for this exchange of vassals, the Gokturks agreed with the Persians to draw a border along the Oxus River. The Persians also renounced their claim to Sogdia. To seal the agreement, Istemi bequeathed one of his daughters to Khosrow as a bride. The relationship of this Turkish princess with the Persian king later produced Hormis IV. The peaceful coexistence was shaken one day due to an incident. The leaders of the Sogdian trade guilds had asked Istemi to travel to the Persian court in Tesaphan. They wanted to obtain permission there to cross Persian territory. Istemi reluctantly agreed. But given the well-developed roads along the Silk Road, it had been easier to send envoys on their way through Iran to Anatolia, rather than have them cross the steppes in Ukraine. When Sogdian ambassadors arrived in the Persian capital, Khosrow accepted the gifts they had brought, and had all their goods bought up. However, to the delegation's dismay, the goods were set on fire in the open street. After Istemi sent a second delegation to Tesaphan, Khosrow even had the Sogdians poisoned this time. This was clearly an open threat to Sogdians and Turks alike. There was no passage for Sogdian traders to Anatolia, and thus no possibility for the Turks to establish relations with Byzantium via the southern land route. Shortly after the incident, a Sogdian named Maniac paid Istemi a visit at court. Maniac was an influential merchant and politician in Bukhara, and asked Istemi to send an envoy under his own leadership directly to Byzantium. According to Maniac's plan, the Sogdians would bypass the Persian market by taking the more dangerous route across the Volga River, where the Turkic-speaking Arnigas, Bulgarians, and other tribal federations lived. He wanted to propose to the Byzantines a political alliance with the Khaganate. Istemi agreed to the plans. In 568, Maniac traveled to Constantinople, where he and his friends were warmly received by Emperor Justin II. Byzantium and Persia had made peace for the time being, but the emperor was still interested in an alliance with the rising Turkic Empire. Here the envoys learned that the Byzantines had had the means to produce silk themselves since 555. 
In what was probably the first case of economic espionage ever, two Sobdians had smuggled silkworms from Khotan and the Gokta Kaganate to Constantinople, on behalf of Emperor Justinian. Nevertheless, Maniac saw the point of his trip to the land of the Eastern Romans, as alliance building was the top priority. The following year, a diplomatic envoy led by the high-ranking Byzantine general Zamarcos, and accompanied by Maniac, left Constantinople on its way back to the Kaganate. Istemi received Zamarcos in Bukhara and treated him kindly, almost brotherly. According to Menander Protector's records, Istemi, who is also referred to as Sizabilos, rested on a golden throne that had two wheels, so that horses could pull it. However, Istemi received the envoys two more times, always at one of his other courts, all decorated with silk and gold. Zemarkos was amazed and impressed at the power and wealth of the Turks. But his mission, and Istemi's desire, were clearly pragmatic. The new alliance was defensive in nature. Should one of the two allies be attacked, by whomever that is, the other would have to come to the military aid of its ally. By 576, five more Byzantine legations had arrived at the court of Istemi, all of which fell victim to raids by Persian mercenaries on the way. But it was already too late, as the alliance between the Gokturks and the Byzantine Empire had been consolidated. The diplomatic reports of the Byzantines moreover, provide information about the social structure of Turkic society. The position and role of women, as already mentioned, was different from what we might imagine today. The Kargans and Begs of the Empire did not take several wives or even concubines, as polygamy was completely unusual, and frowned upon among the ancient Turks. Only later, after the disintegration of the Empire, and at the beginning of the Islamization of the Turks, polygamy was increasingly practiced. The envoys were surprised above all by the power of certain Turkic women. According to Menander, a Byzantine delegation on its way to the Kaganate crossed a land called Akagas, which was named after a woman, who ruled independently over the tribes living there. The role of the Turkic woman in history is also evident elsewhere. The alliance that the Gokturks had made with the Zhu in East Asia was linked to the marriage of Mukun's daughter to Emperor Wu. But the lost war against the Qi changed the political climate, in the spring of 565, Wu sent a delegation of 120 people, led by Yu and Chun, to the Gokturk territory. The plan was to escort Mukun's daughter to Zhu territory, and crown her empress. Mukun refused, and detained Yu and Chun's delegation. A few years later, a great storm inflicted heavy damage on Mukun's golden tent. The Kargan took this as a sign of divine disapproval for his revocation of the marriage offer, and in return allowed Yu and Chun's delegation to escort his daughter to the Zhu court. When the daughter and princess of Turkic descent arrived in the Zhu capital Chang'an, she was personally welcomed by Emperor Wu and made his empress. At least, this is how it happened according to Chinese chronicles. The veracity of this story must not be assumed in its entirety, for it imposes on the Turks a stereotype, that the Chinese often cultivated about nomadic peoples. Mukun is portrayed throughout the chronology of the Chinese as a powerful and courageous ruler, but from the perspective we have just illustrated, he was also stubborn and naive. So were the Huns prior to the Turks, supposedly. Only after a great storm did he realize his mistake, and the Chinese emperor, unlike Mukun, was merciful and did not hold a grudge. This was obviously written in favor of the emperor. Nevertheless, it is a historical fact that the Turkic princess entered the service of the emperor and became an empress. She is described in the sources as immensely beautiful, and always appropriate in her actions. Interestingly, Emperor Wu does not seem to have favored her personally, as there were other women at his court who were ethnically Chinese, and thus first class. It was only after Lady Do intervened that he treated her more favorably in day-to-day -day politics. Lady Do was the emperor's niece. She wanted her uncle to show greater favor to the empress, to appease her home state, and to be able to pull them more strongly to the side of the zoo. This speaks volumes about the connection between the young Turkic women and her family, the Ashina. She proved to be the main link, and guarantee, of the Gokturk Zoo alliance. At the zoo court, they gave her the name Empress Ashina. In 578, Emperor Wu died, and his son, Yuan Yun, ascended the throne as Emperor Xian. He honored Empress Ashina as an Empress Dowager. This basically meant that even though Empress Ashina was a widow, she remained at the Chang'an court, and was given preferential treatment by everyone else. She had basically risen one rank in the court's social hierarchy. After his death, she was again honored by his successor, this time as Great Empress Dowager. 
Shortly thereafter, the Zhu dynasty was usurped by Emperor Xian's father-in-law, Yang Jian, who as Emperor Wen, would establish the powerful and infamous Sui dynasty. He had most of the courtiers in Chang'an killed, but Empress Ashina was not to be harmed. This seems to have been a strategic decision on Wen's part, as he did not want to mess with the Turks, for the time being. A year later, in 582, Empress Ashina died. She had just turned 31. She was buried on April 29, and has recently attracted the interest of contemporary historians and archaeologists alike. Her tomb, discovered in 1993 in Xinjiang, in East Turkestan, has been looted several times, but some of the artifacts, including a certain seal, have been preserved. The Golden Seal of Empress Ashina is the first medieval example of the Golden Seal script. While this script was invented sometime during the Han Dynasty a few centuries earlier, it came back into use during the Zhu Dynasty. Mukan was inherited by Taspa, another son of Bumin. Taspa was now ruler of a walled empire. At one point, the Khagan referred to the Chinese emperors as his sons. However, upon assuming office, he took upon himself an enormous responsibility. As the undisputed leader of all Turkic people, he had a wide range of military and political tools at his disposal. At that time, the Khaganate already covered some 6 million square kilometers. Therefore, organizational changes had to be made. In the first year of his rule, Taspa appointed his nephews, Ishbara and Boru, as lesser Khagans. Then, he turned his attention to the changing geopolitical situation in China. The once proud regents of the northern Qi dynasty had been conquered by the Zhu within a year. But the Zhu were not the only ones with political and military power. When they controlled almost the entire border to the Gokturks, Taspa made a logical decision. He switched his alliance partner. After 30 years of friendship with the Zhu, he wanted to support their rivals to prevent a unified Chinese state and keep the balance of power in his favor. The Zhu had simply become too powerful. However, declaring war on them would have been disadvantageous. Factors that militated against this were free trade along the Eastern Silk Road and the presence of Empress Ashina at the Zhu court. Instead, Taspa capitalized on the desperation of Wan Chaoyi, noble of the Qi, who had tried in vain with his troops to prevent Zhu rule. Supporting him was a subtle way to build pressure on the Zhu. The Qi Empire had a difficult time in the face of attacks by the Turks and Zhu. Only under Emperor Hu Zhu did a period of stability begin. Nevertheless, he is blamed in Chinese history books for the rise of corruption and financial lavishness. Linked to this emperor is the key figure in this conflict, Hulu Guang, commander-in-chief of the Qi army. This man, who had recently defended his homeland against the Turks, died as a result of a palace conspiracy by Hu Zhu's intervention. And the general's assassination indirectly ushered in the downfall of the Qi. When the Zhu invaded the Qi in 577, the other generals were unable to repel the attack. This series of events spurred Xiaoyi into action. When the young prince arrived in May, the locals welcomed him and supported the resistance movement. Xiaoyi led them into battle with his loyal troops. In 577, Xiaoyi's army attacked Jinyang. The attack was unsuccessful. The situation worsened when the Zhu launched a counterattack. The resistance movement was then forced to retreat to Mei. Within a few days, the Zhu army arrived there as well. Their general Shenju defeated Xiaoyi in a battle and forced him to flee. This was reason enough for Xiaoyi to leave his homeland for good. When he arrived at the court of Taspa, he had a reputation to repair. He wanted to become emperor of the northern Qi and then ruler over all of northern China. At that time, Taspa was nothing less than the most influential man in all of Eurasia, and the most powerful ruler in the Vault. Perhaps, he had not earned this reputation, for Taspa had followed in the footsteps of his brother Mukan. And now he welcomed someone from a family, that had fought for everything the Ashina dynasty had stood for, from the very beginning, an independent Turkic state. But Taspa's decision was based on strategic considerations. Pragmatism took precedence in these times. At the same time, Emperor Wu of the Northern Zhu dynasty died. Xiaoyi saw this as the perfect opportunity to march into China and expel the Zhu. Wu's death, in fact, sparked several revolts throughout the Qi region. The most significant one took place near modern-day Beijing. Lu Changqi became the leader of a peasant revolt. 
He then welcomed Xiao Yi, who had arrived from the north, and allied himself with him. As a higher-ranking member of the Gokturuk Chi coalition, Taspa proposed that Xiao Yi and his few thousand Chinese troops invade Zhu territory while being supported by Turkic forces. However, he did not send any Turkic general into battle. Xiao Yi attacked Jicheng. This time he was successful and even defeated the subordinates of his old rival Shenju. However, Shenju was again one step ahead and attacked the rebels' flank, killing the peasant leader Lu. This prompted Xiaoyi's forces to retreat to Gokturk territory. Unfortunately for him, Turkic diplomats had sought an official peace treaty with the Northern Zhu, on behalf of Taspa. Their new emperor, Xian, tried to make a deal with the Kargan. He promised him his cousin, Princess Qianjin, as wife, if Taspa would deliver Xiaoyi to the Zhu. After a ruse involving Xiaoyi, Taspa, a Zhu agent, and a wild hunt in the forest of Ochukan, Xiaoyi was captured, and delivered with Taspa's consent. Taspa had indeed abandoned his former ally. This sealed the fate of the Qi, and ended Taspa's two-pronged strategy. But the Chinese influence on him had just started. The influx of the northern Qi nobility into the Gokta Kaganate exerted some influence on internal affairs in Ochukan. The most notable example is the conversion of the Kargan from Tengrism to Buddhism. Sometime in the late 570s, during the Qi War of Independence, Taspa was visited by the Chinese monk Weilin. The monk converted Taspa to the Buddhist religion. The Kargan then even built a Buddhist pagoda, specifically for his new Chinese friend, as well as for all his subordinates, who were also to convert. During the conversion period, Taspa also gained interest in Chinese culture, which he fully absorbed after building the pagoda. But contrary to Taspa's thought process, the Turks did not follow him. According to the available sources, not a single member of the Ashina dynasty, no Uzbek, and not one individual from the common people, converted to Buddhism, during this period of time. The Turkic people still adhered to Tengrism. Perhaps this religion, or rather philosophy, suited their daily life, and mentality, better than Buddhism. After all, their connection with Mother Nature was already anchored in Tengrism. Something they did not see in Buddhism. Moreover, the Turks were skeptical of this form of Buddhism in particular. This religion originated in what is now Nepal, and was later spread to China. The version to which Taspa was converted, corresponded to Chinese Buddhism, and thus included some views that were specifically Chinese. A danger for the seminomadic Turks of the steppe, as history was to prove. When Taspa passed away in 581, he left behind a walled empire of ginormous proportions. It had withstood all the crises and conflicts of the past 30 years. Istemi, who had died in the meantime, had also made his contribution to the rise of the Ashina. But when the Turkic nobility gathered in Otukan for the Toy, the National Assembly, to elect Taspa's successor, the darkest chapter in the Book of the Gokturks began. For all the Kargan's power, he had not been a despot, and the Torah dictated, that in times of crisis, the nobility had the right to elect the next Kargan. However, the situation at the Assembly was tense. Normally, the succession system followed the tradition that the ancient Huns had cultivated. The deceased ruler A was followed by his younger brother B, then A's son, then his cousin, and B's son, and so on. But this time the tradition was overridden on the toy by a prince named Ishbara, the son of the long dead Isik, and lesser Kargan under Taspa. Now, he objected to Taspa's inheritance arrangement. Taspa's wish had been to select his nephew, Torman Aper, son of Mukan, as the next Kargan but designated successors did not exist among the Turks. The Kargan had no right to choose his own successor. This age-old rule was intended to prevent the power of the throne from remaining in the hands of a single line of the dynasty for generations. A touch of democracy? Since all of Taspa's brothers had already died, the eldest man of the next generation would have had to follow after his death. The eldest of all sons in this case was Amrak, the actual son of Taspa. But the prince held back with his objection. Besides, there was another problem with the succession to the throne that might do him or Ishbara justice. Most of the nobility was composed of Turks or people who had defected to the Turkic cultural sphere. 
and the establishment of the Gokturk Empire was due to the desire to lead the Turks to independence. So, a Turk was to become Kargan, as before. That is why there was particularly strong opposition to Taspa's decision, because Apa had had a non-Turkic mother. Allegedly, according to Ishbara, she had even been of lower rank. Taspa's violation of tradition, and Apa's non-noble, non-Turkic origins, sparked a dispute at the toy. At that moment, Ishbara threatened a revolt, if Apa was elected. He proposed Amrak as an alternative. The delegates accepted. But Amrak's rule did not last even a year. For Apa rebelled against the decision, and declared Amrak's rule illegitimate. The prince enjoyed great prestige among his followers, and was able to mobilize them for a revolt. The cautious Amrak relied on diplomacy and resigned from his post. He believed that he had thus averted Tormund's revolt. But he proposed Ishbara as the new Kargan. The displeasure of the nobility developed into an open rebellion, this time against Ishbara. Apa then declared war on Ishbara. He received support from Tardush, the son of Istemi, and his direct successor. Tardush had ruled the west of the empire for six years. At first, however, there was no military confrontation. As a result of the power struggle in Otukan, Tardush intervened in the affairs in the east of the empire, violating another unwritten rule of the ruling house. Tardush had already expressed his desires for seizing power in the Kaganate to Valentinus, an envoy from the Byzantine Empire, during a meeting. He wanted to grow beyond his current office, a vice should after all, someday, become all-powerful emperor. Apa, Ishbara, Amrak and Tardush. It had not been foreign powers that had put the welfare of the Kaganate at stake. But foreign countries certainly played an important role in the events that followed. While the princes only wanted to seize power, and continue to rule, there were rulers elsewhere who wanted to destroy the Kaganate. Since Taspa's death, a political entity had developed in the south, that posed the greatest threat yet to the Turks. An empire that would act against Turkic interests not with soldiers, but with spies and agents. The Chinese Sui Dynasty. The Zhu general, Yang Jian, now controlled the Zhu Empire and ruled, temporarily, one of the largest and most powerful states in Asia. However, some high generals like Yu Qi Jiang were skeptical. They openly rebelled against him. Yang picked off each rebel individually, and crushed them. To ensure that no rebellion ever broke out of the headquarters again, Yang had the city of Ye Cheng, the former capital of the Qi, and main camp of the rebels, burned to the ground. Yang obviously spared no effort to stay in power. He survived several assassination attempts during these turbulent times. The actual successor of Xian, who was related to him, gave in to pressure, and transferred the Zhu imperial title to Yang. Only now could Yang officially elevate himself to emperor, and bury the legacy of the Hunnic Qi and Zhu dynasties, ruling families with nomadic ancestors. Yang finally became emperor Wen, founder of the Sui dynasty. When ignored the Turks' expectations, for as emperor of China he did not voluntarily submit to the Kargan. This in turn angered Ishbara, as the Gok Turks had held power in Northeast Asia for 30 years. A war was inevitable. But it came differently than expected. The 550s had been a time of awakening for the Gokturks. The 560s a time of victories. And the 570s a decade of tensions. Now, in the 580s, not only the question of power in the Kaganate, but also tensions with foreign powers culminated. Whether in the west or east of the Kaganate, the unstable political conditions made it difficult for the Turks to focus on their foreign policy goals. But given their ambitions, the following three young princes could not be held back. The territory that Tardush ruled corresponded to those lands that his father Istemi had left him. He was in constant contact with the Byzantines. Against the Persians in the south, he undertook a short plundering, but the Oxus remained as the Turkic-Persian border. Then, a diplomatic éclat with his old allies happened. The last diplomatic mission by the Byzantines that we know of was in 576. Turks had, who was one level below Tardush in the political hierarchy, received Valentino's mission brusquely and unfriendly. Valentino's task had been to inform the Turks of Tiberius' ascension to vice-emperor of Justin, and at the same time, to reaffirm the Turco-Roman alliance against Persia. But Turks had was in a fury. 
he accused Valentinos of still harboring the Avars, and thus preventing the Turks from taking revenge. Because of his lowly position as governor, he did allow Valentinos and his companions to move on to the court of Tardush, but shortly thereafter, he goaded Anagai, prince of the Utigas, and Bokhan, a Turkic general, to invade. In a surprise attack that same year, the combined forces of Anagai and Bokhan besieged the city of Bosphorus, on the Crimean Peninsula. Shortly thereafter, the Gokturks joined in, and laid siege to the ancient Greek fortified city of Shersomes. The empire of the Gokturks had reached its westernmost border. However, there was no war against Byzantium, and Tardush was able to negotiate with Valentinos, that the alliance would continue. The occupation of Crimea however, was maintained by the Turks. As punishment for the Byzantine misbehavior, and to forestall of our expansion. Meanwhile, Ishbara Kargan was moving against China. He immediately took advantage of the chaos there, and launched a campaign against the Sui. He got assistance by a rebel general named Bayoning, who had been a relative of Shawi. Together, the Turkic and Chinese troops captured several border garrisons. Despite the sectarian violence at home, Ishbara also asked Tardush, who had rushed in from Crimea, Apa, and his brother Barga, to invade China. With combined forces, the Gokturks conquered a wide strip of northern China, for the very first time ever. The Chinese wall had been useless for a long time anyway. Just as the Turks were about to advance to the capital Chang'an, news of a rebellion at home reached them. The Tila Federation had taken advantage of Tardush's absence, and revolted for the first time in decades. As a result, Tardush withdrew his troops, and quickly marched to the west of the Gokturk Empire. In order to quell the rebellion in his own empire once and for all, and at the same time drive the Turks out of China, Emperor Wen ordered a general mobilization. He launched a surprise attack near Paidao in June of the year 583. The Turkic army had been completely unprepared and was badly hit. After this act of recklessness, Ishbara, Apa, and Barga, had to withdraw. But the situation worsened, a deadly disease was rampant in the army. On the retreat, many Turkic warriors met their death. At this moment the Chinese agents and spies intervened. They stirred up discontent in the army, and incited the commanders against each other. A dispute arose again between Apa and Ishbara. Apa left with his soldiers to the west, but Ishbara followed, and this time actually attacked him. Apa's troops lost the skirmish, and had to retreat even further west. But again, Ishbara was on their heels, and again they were defeated. Apa fled in panic to Orjukant, to the new court of Tardush, who was still busy with the Tila rebellion. Ishbara, whose army had advanced very far to the west, secured the obedience of the local rulers before returning. In doing so, he merged the armies of the lesser rulers with his own, and with a superior number of soldiers, he marched once again en route to China. Some begs joined Apa's army in horror of Ishbara's recklessness. But Ishbara's joy at seizing power was short-lived. The Chinese had successfully fermented dissent within the Turkic nobility, first they had instigated Apa's war against Ishbara, and subsequently even turned Ishbara's brother Barga against the Kargan. After giving up the pursuit of Apa and returning to Otukan, Ishbara even had Apa's mother, his own aunt, murdered. More and more begs turned away from him to join Tardush's army. In one of the most ironic turns of Turkic history, Ishbara suddenly asked the Chinese for help. His platonic wife, Qian Jin, widow of Taspa, nursed a grudge against the Sui dynasty. However, Emperor Wen ordered a rapprochement with her. She then received visits from Sui diplomats in Otukan. On their advice, Ishbara turned to the Sui. In the process, a spy named Zhong Sunsheng accurately recorded all Turkic traditions and events, and reported them to Emperor Wen. His knowledge enabled the Emperor to send out more spies, this time to the Western Turks. In return, Ishbara received military protection from Emperor Wen's troops. The Emperor thus was able to play Ishbara off against the Western Turks. And the spies who lived at the court of Tardash were already planting the seeds for the next dispute, this time in the western part of the empire. For if Ishbara were to be defeated by Tardash and his allies, Wen would only have to give the order for the stronger Western Turks, to be the next to splinter. In the end, the danger from all Turkic rulers, be they Kargans or Begs, would be averted. At least, this was Emperor Wen's train of thought. The Chinese played the game of divide and rule. Their plan certainly worked. 
In September of the year 585, in the third year of the civil war, the Western Turks marched to Otukan. Ishbara had already fled to China. It is not known what really happened after, we only know that Ishbara and Apa died, at the same time, in 587. But any Turk, who had hoped that the civil war would finally come to an end, was to be utterly disappointed. For the division of the Khaganate had already been completed. Tulan inherited Ishbara. Tardush had now seen his chance in the west to drive out Tulan, and declare himself the sole Khagan. But his plan to generate support by defeating China did not work. Due to the long distances his army had to travel from West to East Asia, and due to poisoned water supplies, he suffered massive losses, without having fought Emperor Wen even once. The Tila, and other tribes, revolted and expelled Tardush, who had to seek asylum in China. There, he died in 603, all alone. Only one of the four princes remained alive. Baga. Perhaps, he had the most honorable fate of them all. Driven by the politically disastrous situation at home, and possibly by droughts resulting from major natural disasters, Baga, as a lowly Kargan, invaded Iran with a large Turkic army. After crossing the Oxus, he conquered the cities of Borg, Herat, Talakan, and Bajis. These were all cities in Bactria, in present-day Afghanistan. The Gokturks then marched westward and reached Tabaristan, the province Istemi had invaded 20 years prior. This time the Sassanids took up arms. They sent General Borom Chobin for a massive counterattack. In the Battle of the Hyrcanian Rock, he defeated the Turkic army and pursued them to the Oxus, where, allegedly, he personally hit Barga with an arrow, killing him. Borom Chobin even reached the Bukhara area. However, a civil war began in Iran, after Borom gathered many loyal troops behind him, and proclaimed himself Persian King of Kings. As a result, his opponent, the young Khosra II, was ironically supported by the Byzantines. Borom lost, and had to flee, ironically to the Turks, his former archenemies. But they received him very favorably. Borom rose to become a respected general in Orjukant, and at one point even uncovered a conspiracy within the Ashina dynasty. A short time later, Khosrow had the general poisoned by a spy. Ultimately, Khosrow had come to power over the Persian Empire with the help of Byzantium. But instead of using this situation to his maximum advantage, Emperor Justin II, old friend of Istemi, turned away from Iran and instead turned his attention towards the Avars, thereby adopting a passive attitude towards the Persians. This proved to be a fatally wrong decision on the geopolitical level. And the Turks? The lords of the steppe had lost the last of the four princes in battle, and moreover important settlements along the Oxus. Admittedly, these were later reconquered by the Turks. But the defeats at the hands of China and Persia, and above all the internal disputes, dealt a massive blow to the Khaganate. Or rather, to both Khaganates. East and West were hostile to each other. Rulers kept exchanging friends and enemies with each other. Who ruled hardly mattered anymore. Whether it was Tulan, Yami, Shibi, or Tardas the Younger, the rulers of the Turks were no longer sovereign, and their desperation was perfectly clear to their opponents abroad. But this was not the end of the Gokturks, not by a long shot. Some thirty years later, the Ashina returned on the Vald stage, this time in two imposing conflicts, again versus Persia and China. This time though, the Turks were fortunate to be led by two capable rulers. The first of them was Tongyabgu. Tong meant as much as tiger, or hero. The young ruler had indeed earned his name. Between 618 and 628, he united the Turks in the Western Khaganate, resumed relations with Byzantium, and intervened in the Byzantine-Persian War, which had now been going on for 20 years. Emperor Heracleos had promised Tong Yabgu gifts and, moreover, booty in the Caucasus, should the Turks help defeat the Persians. Tong then sent an army of 1,000 men through the dangerous Persian territory, to deliver his message to the emperor, I shall take revenge on your enemies and will come with my valiant troops to your help. Then, he ordered Bori Shad, his nephew, into battle. In 627, the latter besieged the fortified city of Derbent, with an army described in the sources as Khazarian. From here, the Turks were able to invade Caucasian Albania and move into Persia. These Khazars were victorious and occupied numerous settlements. When the Byzantines joined from Anatolia, the Gokturks besieged Tiflis in the Kingdom of Iberia.
Heracleos and Tongyabgu met in the camp, embraced respectfully, and gave each other gifts. The Turks withdrew after two months, and the Byzantines marched to Nineveh, where they triumphed over the Persian army. Encouraged by this victory, Tongyabgu returned, successfully invaded Tiflis, and had the city sacked. His tax plans indicate that he intended to incorporate the Caucasus into his empire, rather than turning back after the plundering. Three years later, when the Persians launched a counterattack, the Turkic general Chorpan Tarkhan would move into Armenia, lure the 10,000 Persians into a trap, and destroy them in battle. But suddenly, all Turkic armies retreated to the steppes. Tongyabgu had been murdered. By his own nephew, Saibai. Tongyabgu went down in history as the conqueror of the Persians, together with his Byzantine ally Heracleos. But he could have achieved much more for his empire, had he not been killed by his own flesh and blood. Political chaos broke out again in the Western Khaganate. This time ten influential tribes, the Onarch, took power. However, the Turks no longer acted in unity. When the Arabs advanced to the north in 636, Turkic power was already exhausted, as was that of the Byzantines and Persians. The second last great king was the Khagan of the east, Ilik. Until then, the Turks had been tribute vassals of the Sway. But after two devastating wars against the Koreans, the Sway Empire disintegrated into civil war. The Turks took advantage of the situation, partly allying themselves with the Koreans. Ilik then directly invaded China. From 621 to 626, he gradually advanced into the interior of northern China with his relative tolls. Only 18 days after Taizong became emperor, and proclaimed the new Tang dynasty, Ilig's troops stood in front of the latter's capital Chang'an, ready to attack. Ilig and Taizong met on the Great Bridge on the Wei River. The Chinese promised tribute to the Turk, so that the Turkic army was appeased and left. But when disputes broke out at Ilig's court the following year, Taizong intervened and supported the deserters. At the same time, Turkic vassals of Ilig, who were also supported by Taizong, revolted. They then became independent. To make matters worse, there was also unrest by the Tartabi, a large Mongol tribe. When Tolo's attempt to suppress the Tartabi failed, Ilik had him, his own relative, apparently tortured for 10 days. As a result, Tolo's fled to China, and Taizong received him benevolently into the court. Finally, Taizong launched a major attack on the Khaganate. He gathered and supported all those who had fallen away from Ilig, and conquered the entire Turkic territory within a few years. Ilig was captured and discouraged, but was received with kindness by Taizong, and treated respectfully at court. However, Taizong did not stop there, and began a decade-long campaign against all the Turks of Eurasia. Step by step, the Chinese got rid of the Turkic threat. Taizong was not culturally averse towards the Turks. He even took the title of Son of Heaven, and is referred to in Chinese historiography as the Heavenly Emperor of the Turks. Nevertheless, he robbed the Turks of their independence in order to bind them to himself. Realpolitik of the finest kind. These events were followed by political fragmentation, hostile invasions, fratricide, environmental disasters, starvation, and death, in both the Western and Eastern Turkic territories. Turkic culture had spread throughout Eurasia thanks to the Ashina family. They had also advanced trade along the Silk Road, and facilitated cultural exchange between China and Eastern Rome. But the most important aspect of being a Turk, liberty, was lost. By the middle of the 7th century, the Gokturks no longer existed. Chinese in the East and Arabs in the West had given the final blow to both Khaganates. But the worst attacks and the greatest suffering had been self-inflicted by the Turks. The greatest enemy of the Turk, at that time, was the Turk himself. For a long time, the Turks lived in darkness. Some of them literally, because the Ashina had disappeared one day without a trace. But they were never really gone, and instead had hidden in a certain cave area on the Altai. There, where their adventure had begun a hundred years ago, they waited for their opportunity to strike again. Like a phoenix, they would rise from the ashes of bygone days and, like Bumin and Estemi, free the Turks from bondage, and lead them into independence. But sovereignty is not simply given. You have to earn it.